Welcome to yet another video in the fine print series. This will cover infotainment and more specifically car audio. Now it may surprise some of you that manufacturers are injecting a ton of money into electronics and technology on the inside part of the car. So much so to hit their budget, they're stripping away some mechanical features or drivability of cars to do this. Now with infotainment, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to upgrade these over the course of ownership. So what you get now, you're gonna be stuck with 10 years from now. Now with car audio, because technology has improved, you have more options and many manufacturers are charging you to get a better audio experience, anywhere from $500 all the way up into the thousands of dollars of price range. There's not a way for many people to know if that money is well spent. So I'm working with an acoustical engineer and what I'm gonna to attempt to do in this video is explain how it's all set up, how it's designed, what systems are worth your money and what systems aren't. In future review videos, we're gonna show you charts of the objective testing of all the sound in the cars that you own. So let's get started. All right, next I'm gonna cover the design and engineering of an audio system in a car. Now let's say you're going to do a kitchen remodel and you put this huge list of things that you want. You want the best appliances, best flooring, countertops, and you look at the budget, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna need a third job to make all that happen. So you start cutting things out, you start changing your design, and then you start building it and you realize, you know what, my refrigerator's way too far away from my working space. I have to walk too far. And then you might have to go back and move certain cabinets or you have to change the design after the fact and it becomes, well, compromised. And th that's exactly the same thing that happens when you're designing an audio system in a car. So let's go over some of the common mistakes or the good things that manufacturers do. All right, much like anything, if a car manufacturer doesn't get the audio engineers or the suppliers involved when they're building the car, things can be a mess after the fact. And that's why I brought up the kitchen example. If you build the door panels wrong, if you choose the wrong materials, things like the headliner design, you wouldn't think this makes a difference, but if you have a very reflective material, you can have sound scattering all over the car instead of being absorbing. And it's just subtle tweaks like that that can make a big difference in the sound quality and uniformity of the sound delivery to the human ear. And if you have to go back and re-engineer this or sacrifice in terms of the materials or the placement of the speakers, you can have a poor performing audio system. So it's super important when manufacturers are designing this that they get the proper people involved from the start. But there are reasons why they don't. Again, one, they don't value it. They don't have the proper personnel that understands that everything that goes into this or really they're just trying to build it as fast as possible and as cheap as possible. And there's many manufacturers that do this. Typically your audio systems with no branding on them can literally have all the speakers in the car could cost them about $50 to maybe even at most $75 for the entire car. That's how little they want to spend on some of this stuff where the more uh, adept manufacturers or the premium audio systems, they will spend more money on the drivers or the speakers themselves. And this is where you get into the better sounding setups. Speakers really are one of the key, the key things to making the audio experience good in a car. If you have cheap drivers, it doesn't matter how the design is, typically it's gonna sound like crap. The second part of it is choosing the right materials. Again, that there's not a lot of reflections speaker placement, the grill design, the plastic design in the car, making sure everything is buttoned down, tightened, and that they're doing the proper testing to find and isolate places that are rattling or creaking or shaking under certain frequencies. And this is a lot of the little detail work that goes into designing an interior space to have that proper audio experience. Now it's time to talk about speaker selection or driver selection and sound signatures. Now, almost every single driver or speaker is manufactured in a few mega factories in China. Now, there's a few smaller ones in Japan and the UK, but for the most part, every single speaker is coming from China. And that choice of design is usually uh, based on cost, of course, and what the acoustical engineer feels is best for the sound signature that the manufacturer wants. So Fiat could come to me and say, look, we want a 
base heavy car. So I, I would go and choose probably the cheapest drivers possible and a, a sub that's just gonna blow your eardrums out for that car because they feel like their customers are looking for that base heavy experience where Volvo would say, Bowers and Wilkins, we want a linear clean sound. And that is what's called a sound signature. Now, one of the primary reasons why I want to start testing audio in cars is the badge engineering that's going on. And what do I mean by that? Well, automakers are licensing a name, sticking it on a speaker grill, on the dashboard, and they're charging you more for these higher end brands. So here's a perfect example. You buy a Ford Edge and you upgrade to the Bang & Olufsen audio setup, which is known in the home audio space as being a higher end brand, and now it's in cars and has been. Or you can go buy a more expensive Audi and it has a Bang & Olufsen audio setup. And in our testing, the, the thing that those two cars share is absolutely nothing. In the case of the Ford Edge with the Bang & Olufsen audio, it tests very poorly. It sounds poorly to the ear compared to what you get in the Audi. They don't have the same speakers, the same amplification, the same design, nothing. But Ford is charging you a lot more for the Bang & Olufsen audio setup in their car. And this is where we can help to kind of weed through, you know, is it worth it? or is it not worth it to upgrade and why? And of course, the end, the, you know, the end responsibility for the quality falls on the manufacturer, like Ford, Chevy, BMW, name it, not so much on the brand name that's on the speaker grill, so keep that in mind. Now, one of the reasons why I said that is because certain manufacturers will go to their suppliers or engineers who are designing audio systems and say, well, we want a Bang & Olufsen sound setup, or we want a Harman Kardon setup, and we only wanna spend $50 on the speakers in the car, which makes it almost impossible for them to do a good system. But certain, certain brands like Harman, because they're so big, they will take the volume uh, over the quality setup. So if they got a contract to put out you know, 150,000 cars, well, it becomes less of an issue. Whereas brands like uh, Bowers and Wilkins or Meridian will typically hold to their brand values and say, look, we only build an audio system to a certain quality and we're not gonna sacrifice to kind of get the volume, the volume cars. So that's where you have to kind of weed through some of it. All right, on to the next segment, which is manufacturer marketing BS to try to get you to buy stuff and how it's difficult to design car audio in a tight space like this. So let's start with that first. The smaller the space, the more difficult it is. And a lot of that has to do with managing bass frequencies because you have a much larger waveform to manage. And if you don't have a lot of space for that to, to, to widen out or to spread out in, uh, it's, it's hard to control it. Same thing with highs and lows. You can have a lot more reflections. But what's worse is glass and vehicles. So if you have a, a bigger space, which oftentimes like a minivan would be perfect, but there's 10 times more glass in a minivan. So anybody that says, well, you can do studio quality audio in an interior or a car interior, a truck interior, it's, it's not possible. It's way easier to, to design a room around sound than it is to design sound around a car interior. So that's why you're never, it's gonna be really hard to find a, a, a car audio setup that, that rivals a studio or a home theater if you do it right. So the next part about this is, the marketing crap. And that is more speakers are better. Surround sound, 3D audio, 20 speakers, ceiling speakers, the 20 subwoofers. And the, the truth is the more speakers you add to a car interior, the worse it typically is because now you have to manage all of those reflections, all the timing from all these different speakers and all the software because 99.9% .9 of your music is stereo two channels, two channels, left and right, that now manufacturers and audio makers are trying to split into 20 speakers. And you have a speaker in the back, you have it in the side, you have it in the ceiling, and they're all at different distances to your ear. So how do you make sure that speaker over there is level with the speaker over here and they're traveling, the sound waves are traveling at equal distance and timings. It's a nightmare to design properly. And I'm gonna tell you one thing, if the car is under $100,000 and it's got 20 speakers in it, chances are it's not gonna be the best thing out there. It's, it's not that it's impossible, but it's way harder than just spending the money on like a four or a six speaker system to get all the timings, spend the money on the good speakers there. It's better to do that, but of course, it's all about marketing. People don't know what's better. 
it's like bigger TVs are better or more megapixels are better or faster computers are better. It's the same mentality there. The next thing to talk about is sound settings. You have 2D audio, you have 3D audio, you have DSP effects like hall or concert hall. And with the advent of infotainment, there's a lot more of it coming. And remember what I said before, almost all your audio sources are two channel, left and right. So these sound engineers are trying to make, or try to make the sound stand out more by adding all of this. 3D audio is a spatial setup. They're trying to create a 3D environment where it's across the X, Y, Z axis. 2D audio is just across the X, Y axis. And the difference is, is where the sound stage is. Like ELS and RO3D will be a more immersive experience. You can, you can hear things with less fatigue coming from different places without having to figure out, well, that's kind of weird it's coming from there. Where like ELS, Panasonic setup has speakers on the ceiling to kind of also give you more effect that way. Now, most of the audio that your ear is able, or that you're able to discern comes below the forehead. So basically ceiling mounted speakers or anything above your forehead is oftentimes just a waste or more difficult to discern. It's, it's mostly for effects, but again, this is all processing and electronics that manufacturers or sound designers are trying to do to make their products stand apart. A lot of that is what this is about. You made it to the last part of the video where I'm going to discuss the testing methodology that we'll use to get objective measurements and graphs other than just saying, well, this sounds pretty good or it sounds loud. And in the future, we're gonna do this on all the cars. So here's how it works. We take a specialized microphone and we place it in different parts of the car where the human ears would be and we take different sound measurements. And in each car, we're going to set the audio system to flat or to studio mode without any DSP or 3D audio effects to get the cleanest signal possible. The second part that we're going to use is Bluetooth audio, which depending on your device and depending on the car, it may pass CD quality audio or better. In older cars, it may not even pass that. And the reason we're not using an aux connection or like USB or any of that is because most every single person that are using vehicles now are using compressed audio. So at worst, Bluetooth is gonna give you your kind of worst measurement and also some of your best measurements at the same time. Now, one of the most important tests is frequency response, which I'm gonna put up a graph here of what kind of good frequency response looks like and bad. And what you wanna see is smooth graduations. So at the 20 Hertz range, which is your low frequency or bass on the left side of the chart, all the way to high frequency. And what you're looking for, again, is smoothness, almost linearity. You don't wanna see a sudden spike and then a drop or fall off and then a huge spike back up because generally that means it's not producing that frequency properly or there's a huge sound reflection that is cutting into that sound frequency. So the smoother that graph and the smoother the roll off, the better it is. The second thing to talk about with frequency response is you'll see some of these charts like this Mazda 3 chart where you'll see a roll off at the rear at the high frequency end. And that's because Bose is purposely rolling off high frequencies, largely in part of compressed music. Because if you're using compressed music in the high frequency, it starts to sound very digital, very tinny, and it can be tiresome to the ears. So they'll roll off those frequencies at that point. Some will roll off bass frequencies because you know, you, typically before, below 60 Hertz in a car, it's kind of a mess or you, you just can't, can't manage it. So you'll see that roll. So that's what we're gonna show you frequency response so you can see smoothness and how manufacturers are doing it. The next test is very important, harmonic distortion which is the alteration or change in the original tone, which can make it sound tinny, boomy, or just harsh on the ears. Now, one of the primary reasons for harmonic distortion is design and, or poor design. If you just stick a speaker in the door and mount it to some plastics and it's rattling, it's gonna sound like crap. But if you build the proper enclosure, a basket, to, to screw the speaker in with the proper insulation, the amount of space that it needs with the proper angles, you're not going to get the harmonic distortion. So again, a lot of it has to do with the design of the interior space, 
and also the speaker or driver design. If you throw in a set of $50 speakers, you have 20, 20 speakers in a car that cost the manufacturer $50, you're gonna have a lot of harmonic distortion. You can't build a, a quality speaker at that price point. So this chart is going to help kind of disseminate that for you. Now I brought this up at the beginning, but I'm gonna reiterate this as you're digesting all these terms. You could take $100,000 worth of audio, speakers, amps, all that, and put it in this 370Z. And then you get out on the road, you have tire noise from super sticky tires, you have a harsh suspension, you have an engine that's not completely uh, devoid of vibration and isolation, you have transmission noise, you have wind noise from the seals, and all that money you spent on your audio setup is thrown out the window when you drive the car. So when I talk about, well, manufacturers are skimping on the audio setup, a lot of this has to do with the fact that they can't afford to also put it in the other areas they need to quiet down the cabin. If you don't have a isolation or a vibration-free cabin with acoustic laminated glass and all this, a high-end audio system doesn't make a lot of sense, and that's important to understand. The other part is step response. The more speakers, the more difficult it is to control timing. So if I'm sitting in the driver's seat, I have a speaker right here and the passenger seat speaker is way over there. So getting those sound waves equalized has a lot to do with the engineering of the DSP or the equalizer, also the drivers. Because the cheaper the driver, let's say you have a paper cone in a, in a driver, that is going to have a delay in how it projects sound out because of the vibration. There might be a delay in how that speaker is controlled because of the paper cone or the type of magnet that's used in the cone design. So there's physical limitations or physical problems with timing or delay from the speaker. And there's also the software side of it or having too many speakers that can affect that. So we're gonna show you the step response or control. And typically you want a nice tight area there for step response and control. And if you see this wave stretched out, well, then there's this timing issue. So when we show you the results, they will typically be from the passenger side space, the front passenger seat, because that's really where your best measurements will come from. The driver's side has an instrument cluster, typically a steering wheel and more things to reflect sound off of. So we wanna show you the best of what you could possibly see. If there's something weird or something strange, we'll show you the back seat measurements, the driver's seat measurements, but for really what you're looking for, you could get way off the deep end with this. And our goal is not to reverse engineer all the audio design. There's just no time for that. You could put dummy heads in here. You could get more microphone setups, more sensitive microphone setups. You can do vibration and NVH testing and suspension and all that. Again, we're not here to redesign the cars. We're just kind of here to help the consumer to show you what audio systems perform way below average and you should have a red flag and not to buy it or just be aware of the performance across the board. Hopefully that helps. Thanks for watching. I will see you next video. Savage geese. <laughs> what a waste of skin. Man, we gotta get rid of this guy. I'm gonna show you how, but first, let's tune this Subaru. I think 60 PSI should be good. Yeah. Let's do it!